church family. I'm Olivia. And I'm Elena. Even though we are separated physically, we are gathered spiritually in the grace of the triune God. So let's humble our hearts for worship and open our souls for the presence of Jesus. Remember the promises of our Heavenly Father and offer your praise. Because our help and hope is in the name of the Lord Jesus. His affection His mercy never ends. He reminds me every morning I am still your faithful friend. He is good to those who seek Him. I wait for Him to bless, and the Lord will be my portion. how many times when I've been struggling with an issue, uh, whether it's small or big, that I've gone for a walk in the park and just spent time praying and thinking, pondering and seeking God. And that during that time, the Holy Spirit of God has ministered to my heart and brought assurance to my soul. If we think of seasons as a metaphor for our current times, I think about the pandemic being winter time. But winter doesn't stay winter. It eventually turns into spring. You can't stop spring and that's a good thing. 
And as I see evidences of spring in the world, it reminds me that there's more to life than this pandemic. God is faithful, and we have a deep and abiding hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, as I long for leaves on the trees, I listen to the birds. And I am reminded of the daily grace that we receive from our God, our Creator and our Redeemer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God hears our prayers and stays with us each day. God loves us very much and keep us close like a child in its mother's arms. Let's say thank you, God, for all the things we are grateful for. And any kids who are watching, join with us for the whole world and all that is in it. 
Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For all our teachers who are who share their knowledge and keep us safe. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For the gifts of music and art to Thank help you, us God. see beauty. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For nurses and doctors and all people who help to heal us. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For all our friends and family, for those we can see and those we cannot. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For the angels and all those in heaven who watch over us all mm -hmm. night and all day. Thank, Thank you, God. For God holds who holds us tight, especially when we are afraid or alone. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. What else are we thankful for? Um, I thank you for my family. Thank me too. I'm thankful for a Christian education where our kids are not only safe, but they're also learning about God. Um, and hopefully we pray that that will continue. And I like our church. And I'm thank you for all our friends and family. Keep safe. This is Philippians 2, verses 1 to 13. If you have enough encouragement, any encouragement, any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like minded having the same love being one in spirit and purpose do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit but in humility consider others better than yourselves each of you should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not Consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in an appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth, and, the, and every tongue Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence, but now more in my absence. 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 Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will act according to his good purpose. And that was Philippians 2, verses 1 through 13. This is the word of the Lord. Did you feel empty this week? I think of all of our teachers and uh, trying to do creative work and figure out how to do things online in order to be able to teach and get all that up in a short time. 
I'm sure after fighting with uh, internet speeds and new programs at the end of the week, you feel just empty, just spent, exhausted. Some of us have lost our jobs for now or fear we will be laid off pretty soon. And you have this empty feeling inside about what's ahead. How are you going to manage? Empty store shelves and empty cupboards, empty wallets and bank accounts, an empty home where you are kind of stationed right now, but separated from friends and family, empty churches as we practice social distancing. What's the feeling of emptiness that you have right now? Where is God for you? For this is still our Father's world. But where is God for you in this emptiness? As I read Philippians 2, I discern this living word revealing to us what we should have known all along, that our old ways of living are empty. In fact, they are a dead end. Living for today and living materially, putting our hope in the things of this world, putting ourselves first, Assuming my way leads to my deliverance. These do not fill us. Paul knew this by experience. He's been empty many times, some by his own doing, some by the will of God. Paul is in prison as he writes Philippians. Unjustly, just because of his belief in Jesus as Lord and Savior, he's most likely starving, threatened, no doubt he's been tortured, no relief. We'd guess Paul would feel pretty empty right now, but he doesn't. He feels full. The letter radiates joy and hope, a fullness and a richness that no earthly circumstance can take away. And the first verses of Philippians chapter 2 invite us to come to the same conclusion as Paul about our own lives right now. Because of Jesus, your life is full. Even today. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. He writes in a way to get us to conclude that, yes, I am encouraged and comforted by the loving presence of Jesus. I am living in the tenderness and compassion of the one gracious God. I experience the Spirit sharing Christ's power with me. Yes, I am full. How can that be? How does that happen? Verses 6 through 8 give us the pattern from emptiness to fullness. It is the pattern of Christ's journey from incarnation, becoming one of us, God becoming human, God with us, through the sacrifice of crucifixion all the way to resurrection and ascension. Jesus emptied himself in order to bring us eternal fullness. And following Jesus, we are blessed to live the same journey to fullness even blessing others with that same fullness in Christ. Look at Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He empties himself, not meaning that he gives up his divinity, but that the creator becomes creature, king becomes servant, the eternal one sacrifices his life. Here are some words to help us understand this from a theologian. He writes, the Son of God possesses the highest dignity, worth, and glory because he shares fully in the one essence of God Almighty. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. That is to say, the Son, before his incarnation, did not see his status as an excuse to seek his own ends at the expense of serving others. 
On the contrary, his equality with God motivated him to make himself nothing and come to earth as a man to meet the needs of his people. This is a reference to his incarnation, the second person of the triune God taking to himself a human nature in the person of Jesus, adding to himself all that is essential to humanity. The Son of God walked the earth as the God-man Jesus Christ in order to meet our deepest need, nothing less than perfect atonement for sin, that we might be reconciled to the most holy creator. In so doing, he provided the clearest revelation of who God is as one whose very disposition is to go to the ultimate lengths to benefit his people. Andrew Root describes it this way for us so we get a a handle on this, how, how we can apply this. He describes it as, although X, not Y, but Z. That is, though Jesus is God, He doesn't use his power to his advantage, but instead becomes one of us in order to die for our salvation. You can even argue the formula is because Jesus is God, he doesn't distance himself from sin and brokenness, but sacrifices himself for us to meet us in death and raise us to new life, to carry us from emptiness to fullness. This prepares us for our own choices, knowing that to love the Lord and our neighbors will mean choosing against our fears, preferring this risky love of God, while also being assured that to give ourselves in service and sacrifice to others may sound like we'll wind up empty, but it really is the way that Christ fills us. How did Paul understand this? Well, that was his story. After meeting the risen Lord Jesus, he heard the judgment of God in what Jesus said to him. Why do you persecute me? But Jesus didn't destroy him in his guilt. He found him in his violent lostness and turned his life around in grace. Paul should have been judged and condemned, but instead he received mercy and salvation. Although God is justified in his righteous anger, the Lord doesn't come in wrath, but reconciles Paul to the Lord through Jesus, though Paul was guilty before the Lord. Jesus didn't condemn him. He saved him and redeemed his life in love. Jesus demonstrated this to Paul through one of his own believers, one of his own followers, Ananias. If you remember the story in Acts chapter 9, after Paul's encounter with Jesus, he winds up blind in a strange house on Straight Street in Damascus. While this has happened, the Lord visits Ananias with a word that commands him to go to Paul. Ananias objects, Lord, this man is coming here to arrest us and to kill us. No, says Jesus, I've chosen him. He will serve the gospel. I'll show him how much he must suffer. For me. So Ananias goes, though afraid, and in one of the most understated verses in the Bible, Ananias comes to Paul and lays a trembling hand on him and calls him brother. Brother Saul. An enemy becomes a brother. Emptiness is filled in a holy way. Do you see the fullness of God? Ananias reflects this Philippians chapter 2 reality. Although Ananias is free to protect himself, live to secure his own life, he doesn't act first for himself. Instead, he responds to the invitation of Jesus to enter into Paul's experience of death and minister to Paul Christ's grace and blessing. Although he is afraid of Paul and wants nothing to do with him, he doesn't refuse the call to help him in his loss and instead shares in Paul's loss with the restoring presence of Jesus. And a life is transformed from emptiness to fullness. Do you see this pattern? We could say it this way. 
Because Ananias is saved by Jesus, he doesn't live for himself. Instead, he lives to serve others with the gospel, even by risking himself to share in another's death or suffering. That's having the same love that Jesus has given you and me. And notice, this man, Ananias, is not an apostle. He isn't one of the pastors, Paul, mentors like Timothy or Titus. He's just a garden variety Christian. He follows this pattern of redemption set by Christ. And we are each graced to live in this fullness. Are you getting the pattern in your mind? Starting to understand the equation? Although and because Jesus died and rose again, not this, but that, not self first, not fear first, but bless and serve instead. Share in another's pain or loss, since this is the love of God in our lives. And your life is transformed. As you share in emptiness, Christ can fill It's a willful emptying that allows Jesus to fill us with the power of the cross. To love when we do not like. To include the excluded. To joyfully share in another's pain and suffering. To forgive when we would rather exact revenge. When I share in the emptiness of another, not just physical, but any suffering or sacrifice or dead end or failing or trouble, when instead of hiding or securing myself or judging another, I share in your loss for Jesus' sake, then Christ is there to bring a fullness, not of our own making. Too often we still choose today to grab and to hang on to what looks like earthly fullness. I'll do right by me. That's the temptation going into what could be a very difficult week for us. The Spirit gives us this pattern of discipleship instead. Although and because you have new life in the love of Jesus... Not that, not self first or safety first or security first, but now this, serve first, sacrifice first, even suffer for me and shoulder that burden. That's the daily journey from death, from loss, through grace, an undeserved response of mercy or kindness to new life filled in Jesus Christ. That's faith in Jesus. Jesus is the holy, righteous God. But he didn't destroy us in our rebellion and unholy living. Instead, he became one of us to minister to us through his death and bless us with his sacrifice. Get it? Love's math equation isn't hard to understand, but like most math, it's hard to master. Are you ready to try it this week? Here are some suggestions. The Holy Spirit counsels us through some examples, even in Scripture, of this same pattern. We can look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, for instance. There we read, Even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority, instead we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. You see it? Instead of controlling, manipulating, demanding, asserting our influence, show care first. Give yourself first. And in the letter to Philemon, Paul writes, Although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. So though you are in your rights by the law of the land to punish your slave Onesimus, I ask you to give up that right in the name of Jesus and welcome him as a brother in Christ and a co-worker in his kingdom. Instead of forcing you, instead of you claiming your rights, I ask you in the name of Christ's love that you love as Jesus loved to restore and reconcile, though you will absorb some loss. 
And then right here in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Blessed by the grace and resurrection of Jesus, don't act selfishly. Instead, value the other person above yourself and look to that person's interests. In each situation, there is some loss, a shared experience of being empty. But faith believes Jesus is present with us in those losses. So when we join another to serve or help in Jesus' name, Christ is there in his resurrecting power to fill us, to, to bring that fullness of eternal life, a new grace, a, a new deliverance, a new rescue, a new hope, a new healing, a new situation. Not of our own making. That's the power of divine love. God's power to save. Just as Jesus emptied himself, but still lived out the presence of God as the Father's Son, so we don't give up our identity as children of God or the assurance of our salvation when we serve another. But because Christ is in us, we are strong and free to bring all the righteousness and holiness of Christ into a difficult situation, knowing the sacrifice, the serving, the emptying, means Christ will fill us in his grace. Why don't we do this naturally? Because we have been convinced to have as little as possible to do with loss. We are afraid that to give, to join in another's loss, is to miss out on pleasure. And we think that means life will be empty. Empty of joy or peace or purpose. But the cross assures us that's where we will experience the true God, our one true desire. For Jesus was vindicated by the Father for his obedience to death on the cross, writes Paul. In his name, his life, his presence is filled above all others with perfect love, mercy, truth, and power. One way or another, we will all bow down to his lordship. I've spoken about this before, but I do it again because I know this way of the love of Jesus is so difficult to trust, especially now. There are so many false messages starting to surround us saying, you have a right to be happy, just do what you love and you'll live longer, stay safe, be well, look out for yourself. In fact, if we're not careful, that's the message we will hear even in church. Even if that's not the message that's preached. It's so deep within us to put ourselves first. One Christian leader whom I respect has pointed out that in American Christianity and for a popular American church, self-sacrifice is the wrong message. He says self-affirmation is the message people want to hear. People seeking self-worth give generously to express and celebrate their inner value. But here I disagree with him. We are made for God. And we yearn for the Lord's love. And by faith, it is found and experienced when Jesus meets us in loss, in death, in emptiness spiritual, material, and otherwise. Because then resurrection is given and we can give him glory. This is the true life, being real in Jesus, having the same love. We can live out this full life, even when we're absent from one another 
as Paul writes to the Philippian church. Work out your salvation this way, he says, even in absence. Don't work for it, but because you have been graciously forgiven and filled, risk sharing in another's emptiness. In that fear and trembling, remember God is at work in you. As the week gets difficult, Christ is with you in that difficulty to fill you again or another by your sacrifice. Empty, we are filled with the power of the cross. Amen. Our best response of gratitude is to pray. So would you join me now in prayer? I know we're separated physically, but we are joined together spiritually, belonging in Christ. And so let us pray together. Gracious God, champion of the universe. We so often fluff ourselves up. Aren't we the only creatures who compose masterpieces of music and art? Don't we govern ourselves, enrich ourselves, promote ourselves? Can't we dunk basketballs, bat baseballs, spike volleyballs? Aren't some of us masters of comic irony? Other creatures don't practice rocket science. We do. And yet, here we are, frightened by a thing so small it can't be seen under most microscopes. It's not even an animal or a plant. It's a virus, a mere parasite, dependent on our own living cells to replicate. And yet it has shuttered our schools, canceled our flights, and emptied our churches. It has consumed the attention of our leading scientists, wrenched our politics out of shape, dominated our conversations, threatened our economics, and scared the daylights out of us. We don't want to get sick, and we don't want to die. We are afraid. Afraid of a microorganism. Afraid of each other. Heavenly Father, great and quiet source of peace, quiet our fears. We are wary, uncertain, strung tight, quiet our fears. We have no idea what the future will bring, but we do know you will be in our future to hold us there. We cannot quiet ourselves, O oh God. We cannot comfort ourselves, cannot heal ourselves, cannot help ourselves. All we can do is wash our hands and keep our distance. Our rocket science is no good to us for this threat. Would you now join with me in, in our prayers as they continue? Uh, follow the screens. We're going to uh, do a little litany together so that we can pray for friends and family, for home and community, and for country and for the world. So please follow along. Together, let us pray for a swift end to COVID-19. For those infected and those who have been exposed, grant them strength, healing, and protection. For their loved ones and caretakers, grant them peace, comfort, and endurance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those governing nations, grant them sound minds, courage, and humility. For physicians, nurses, technicians, researchers, administrators, and all other healthcare employees around the world, grant them strength by your life-giving spirit, wisdom and resources to do the work before them. Together we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those who must work despite the threat of sickness, grant them protection and continued provision. For those who have become unemployed or underemployed during this pandemic, grant them comfort, wisdom, and financial provision. For churches and their ministries, grant them discernment and creativity to lead and minister in unprecedented circumstances. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For parents and families, grant them wisdom, patience, and joy. For children, grant them protection from fear. For those who are pregnant, grant each woman safety and a healthy pregnancy. 
for those whose home is not a safe place, grant them refuge. For those who are alone, grant them a sense of your nearness and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For schools, administrators, teachers, and aides, and for all students, grant that these unprecedented educational efforts continue to craft in students abilities that will serve your kingdom. For all those educating from home, grant the resources in order that learning continue. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For all navigating decisions during this time of uncertainty and fear, grant them your peace. And for all the prayers we cannot voice because our language is insufficient or our ignorance too great, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And together we end our prayer. O oh God, great and quiet source of peace, Quiet us, your anxious ones, and let us cling for comfort to your suffering Son, Jesus Christ. Gather us under his wings. Remind us that he suffers with us, but he's also the great physician. In him let us not be afraid. Please, let us not be afraid. Amen. This morning's offering is for the Timothy Tuition Assistance Fund. There are two ways to give while you are absent from church. First, you can send a check to church through the mail. Second, you can use the Givelify app. You can also find Givelify on church's website. On our website, click on the resource tab. Under the resource, click on giving. Then click on the Givelify logo. I would like to thank the convocation for supporting the Timothy Tuition Assistance Fund. We are right on track to finish paying Timothy tuition assistance by the end of the school year. As of the end of February, we still owe $16,000. Thank you for making it possible for every family that wants to send their kids to Timothy a reality. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Timothy Christian Schools. We ask that you be with the teachers and faculty while we are getting through this difficult time in learning. We ask that you give our students, teachers, and parents peace and patience to get through the lessons being taught. Be with all our students uh, in our congregation as they adjust to these new norms. We know that you are in control of all things. We ask all these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, to my raptured soul shall find rest. Beyond the river Near the cross, O Lamb of God Bring it seems before me Help me walk from day to day With its shadow Shadows on me in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find us beyond the
We've come to the end of our worship service for this morning. I hope you have experienced something of fellowship and belonging that we share in Jesus Christ, even though we're uh, apart from one another physically. And now we go in that grace of God. We are still sent out by the Holy Spirit with the mission of Jesus Christ to love and serve in his name. And so to that end, let's receive God's uh, benedictory words, that, that good blessing from God to go in his grace and peace. So brothers and sisters, God go before you to lead you. God go behind you to protect you. God go beneath you to support you. God go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. May the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you. Do not be afraid. Go in the peace and love of God to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.